Uh, welcome, everybody. My name is Van Butzik. I'm one of the co-directors of the Cannabis Research Center at UC Berkeley. Welcome to our webinar today, uh, where, we, we, where we will be discussing cannabis and equity. I would like to thank our um, supporters, the Campbell Foundation, the Social Science Matrix, Berkeley uh, University of California, Agriculture and Natural Resources, Berkeley Rouser College of Natural Resources, and the Resources Legacy Fund. Real quickly, before we jump into the panel, I just want to introduce the center. The Cannabis Research Center is we promote in interdisciplinary scholarship on the social and environmental dimensions of cannabis. Our emphasis are scientific research and public engagement. And we seek to inform public dialogue and contribute to the development of prosperous, equitable communities and healthy environments. Three main focal areas of our research group are environmental impacts, policy and regulation, and cannabis producing communities. We have loads of information on our website, crc.berkeley.edu, where you can find all of our peer reviewed publications, uh, as well as a number of videos, science briefs, and of course, recordings of these Zoom webinars. So if you missed a recording or you wanna go back and listen to this one, again, uh, go right ahead. Uh, today's webinar is going to be uh, an hour long, but we have a feeling that discussion will be robust, so we may uh, let it run a little bit long today rather than, rather than try to tamp it down. So um, if you need to leave uh, before we're done, that's fine. Just leave and you can come back and check it out when we post it online. With that, it's a great pleasure to hand it over to Laura Herrera, who will be the moderator of today's panel. Laura? Thank you so much, Van. Uh, we've been starting our webinars with the land acknowledgement. Um, UC Berkeley sits on unceded Ohlone land, and probably anywhere you are um, in the United States, you are on um, native territory. And with that, I want to move into my slides. And, this, and the topic that we're talking about today, which I want to ground us in, in ethics. Um, I think everybody on the panel shares this sentiment that we want to uphold ethics in cannabis policy. Um, and that all groups affected most negatively by the war on drugs through death, imprisonment, dispossession, and disenfranchisement should benefit from and be served first by cannabis legislation. So my moral compass and the groups that I identify in um, trying to work with um, as the most uh, marginalized groups are the prisoners, patients, and the social equity system, which we'll be talking about today. So that begs the question, what is social equity? Uh, this is a broad concept referring to things like parity, justice, and fairness in written and social systems. But very specifically in California, cannabis social equity is a series of laws. Um, historically, this started in the 90s with the Compassionate Use Act, which gave exemption for patients and caregivers to possess or cultivate marijuana. And in 2017, with Prop 64, we moved into adult use and commercial sales um, and started directing cannabis tax revenue to community reinvestment grants. In 2018, these laws got more specific with the California Cannabis Equity Act when the interagency uh, collaboration of the Bureau of Cannabis Control and the Governor's Office of Business and Economic Development um, started to work together for two years to administer these cannabis equity grant programs. So recently, uh, the BCC submitted a 400 plus page report to the California legislature regarding the progress of the 16 equity programs who receive funding. This is what it looks like, it's long, I skimmed it for you. Um, and in a nutshell, what it's saying is that we have a statewide uh, equity ecosystem. They're struggling. The barriers to entry are financial and technical in this new and loosely understood market. There are active cannabis social equity programs, which is literally the implementation of the regulations. And this is where social justice and cannabis business meet the brick wall of bureaucracy. Uh, the enrolling and verifying of these participants um, is where the data and the record keeping starts. Um, and then these city departments have to provide administrative service to the verified individuals, 
who might receive a host of services um, depending on the jurisdiction that include priority licensing, fee waivers, administrative support, and other technical services, and sometimes funding. So expanding these services is crucial to maintaining the momentum and the success of these programs. Um, oversight is also really important. Um, education and informa information sharing with the intergovernmental departments the community, the verified participants will improve how a city or county delivers these services. And what I like to tell my clients and the people I work with in cannabis when this starts to seem too big of a, an insurmountable challenge is that these are the very early financial models for cannabis banking. This, this is the first, the first iterations of public banking on the local and regional level where um, we have products like loans available, um, no repayment grants, property purchase programs, shared kitchen programs, workforce development programs. And it's important to notice that these are financial solutions that can be requested or designed by the community to best serve them. Even a bank charter, which is like a bank state license, can be created and maintained by a community. And dare I say, we could move towards reparative and more sustainable solutions like cooperative models, land trusts, and honor taxes. So um, with this context in mind and, um, and understanding some of the barriers like overwhelmingly high cannabis arrest rates um, for overwhelmingly male, Latino and black individuals um, is why they're not prepared to become small business owners immediately. And then there's the high cost of licensing, permitting, architectural planning, geography, the suitability and availability of land and, um, and even once we have an ecosystem going, there could even be competition for licensing within this ecosystem. So it's very complex. And um, to dive even deeper into these topics, we have a great panel of illustrious guests, starting with Commissioner Lenise Martin uh, from the Oakland Cannabis Regulatory Commission uh, and the Executive Director and Co-Founder of the Hood Incubator. And then we'll hear from Ramon Garcia, who is the founder of Equity Trade Certification a really interesting new topic. And Dominic Corva, who is the co-director of the Humboldt Institute for Interdisciplinary Marijuana Research, and also a cannabis equity specialist for the California Center for Rural Policy at Humboldt State University. And last but not least, we'll we'll, we will hear from Bill Armeline, who's the director of the Human Rights Institute and associate professor of sociology at San Jose State University. And then Edith Kinney, who is a legal coordinator, Human Rights Institute, and associate professor, Department of Justice Studies, also at San Jose State University. So with that, I'm going to move on to letting Lenise take the stage. And uh, Lenise, it's all you. Hi, everybody. Uh, uh, thank you for being here. Thank you for hosting this event. Um, Yes, my name is Lenise Martin. I'm the current executive director of the Hood Incubator, as well as the chair of Oakland's Cannabis Regulatory Commission. Um, with my work at the Hood Incubator, uh, we seek to leverage the legal cannabis industry to end the drug war and reverse its impact. Uh, meaning in simple terms, we recognize the people power that the uh, cannabis industry has been demonstrating, especially at the ballot box. and uh, we think that uh, the same skills required to, uh, or that they acquired along the way to pass cannabis legalization and cannabis legal and, and equity programs, it's the same skills that would be required to actually go the full way and end the drug war and reverse the, the impacts of the drug war. And so um, we, we work around that, you know, folks that are already eager and interested and, and, and have that, that civic mind and, you know, cannabis. Uh, uh, community intersection. Uh, then with the chair of, of, of Oakland's Cannabis Regulatory Commission, um, I've, I've got to play many roles. One, just showing up to community meetings, two, being a member, and then recently at some point last year, becoming the vice chair and, and chair. Um, and so when I became chair, one of the things that I was really wanted to focus on was making sure that uh, the commission was able to identify and really understand what role we were trying to play. And we identified uh, that we want to focus heavy on the equity program. But we also recognize that um, the equity program is just kind of like a niche set of small businesses in general. 
And so uh, you, you can't have a strong equity program if you don't have a strong foundation, meaning you can't have a small equity program if you don't have support for small businesses in, in general. Um, and then having to come to terms with what does that mean for our policy making and, and we can't keep uh, isolating out groups uh, uh, and, 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 and then wondering why uh, progress is, is so much slow. And so I think equity program, I really think it has to be somewhat kind of core to, to what you're thinking about. I think between the work with the Hood Incubator and the commission, I am biased, but I feel that we have one of the most comprehensive equity programs in the state, but also the country. Um, I can't speak on other countries because I haven't began to follow them yet. Uh, but in this country, uh, we have one of the most comprehensive programs. And I think it's because uh, a lot of the stuff that uh, we were talking about in 2016, um, when folks were laughing and saying, that's not gonna happen, are happening now. And folks are saying, good job. And um, I think a part of that is um, the ability to, to pivot, not just the other side, to say the call the times, but I pivoted as well. Um, Maybe pivot, maybe not this vision, but maybe the language I used, uh, maybe how I went about organizing, maybe who I talked to. Um, but I would say, like some of the, and some of those things I'm talking about, uh, uh, public use of land. Um, I was like, y'all, y'all have city buildings, you know. So I, in the, in the beginning, I imagined that it was a building that the city already owned. In the end, it's the city sent an RFQ and told folks to go find a building we got $2 million to give you, um, right? And so if I wasn't gonna be able to, if I was stuck to the tactic, you know, I wouldn't have been able to, to we wouldn't have been able as a community to keep to keep focus on the vision. Um, we, we also have uh, uh, shared kitchens. Um, uh, so when I started off, I was talking about producer co-ops. Well, Everyone wants to be their own CEO. No one wanted to be the co-owner of $10,000. Everyone wanted to be the solo owner of a penny. Um, so, you know, uh, how do you overcome that? You know, well, no, I, how, we, now we have shared kitchens. How, what's the relationship between shared kitchens and cooperative economics? Pretty close. But do you get to have the mental, mentality that you're still the CEO of a penny versus the co-owner of, of a thousand or whatever? Yes but you're actually starting to move towards cooperative economics. And we're actually maybe now with this experiment, maybe in 12 months to 18 months and have folks go full forth with actually diving into cooperative economics instead of just dip, dipping their toe in at, well, these pilot projects. So those are just two examples of how back in 2016, 2017, we were calling it one thing with the vision um, for just you know, seeing more participation in the industry and for me, those aren't things that I'm really that excited about. You know, like I, I always joke, joke and say, I could care less if you're allowed to sell weed um, or if you're allowed to smoke weed. What I really care about is have we dismantled um, the, the, the laws that got put in place and forced the law of criminalizing um, addicts, not even sellers, but addicts. Um, and so, yeah, so, so, so when you organize folks that are trying to do these things, open these businesses, and they start seeing all these challenges, of course, then they start realizing how policy um, is important. So we do the economic development, the workforce development, and the business ownership. That's the direct service. That's meeting people where they're at, where, they, where they're interested in the cannabis. But then they're going to notice all the frustrations, and then they, they're naturally going to have to start doing some policy advocacy work. And from doing that policy advocacy work, they're going to recognize how maybe it seems like some people are able to exercise their power more easier than they're able to exercise their power. Maybe like when they speak to Senator XYZ, um, they seem that they, they don't hear as good as when someone else speaks to Senator XYZ. And what does that mean and, and what is happening and, and what is power and influence and, and all that mean? And that's where we do a third part of the work, which is the part that I actually care about, um, the power building. Um, how do we take a, a, a community, which I say the, the cannabis community is one of the fastest voter blocks in the country, again, demonstrated by what we're doing at the ballot box. Um, how do you take uh, 
uh, that group of people and, and actually help demonstrate their power just beyond the ballot box. Because what happens is it's like we could, the cannabis community comes together, get something passed, and then these other people come in and like, all right, we got it from here, kids. Uh -huh. Well, uh, we got it from here. You did a good effort, but you you know you don't know what you're doing now. You know, it's it's amazing you got it this far. Hats off to you. That's amazing. But let's just, you know, call it what it is, you know, go sit down and we got it from here. And 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 that's why it's just, it just takes a, it takes a, it takes a 180 turn um from the intent of the folks that mostly got it passed to then the folks who are mostly being listened to. So that's about the work that we do at the Hood Incubator. We've got some programs coming out. Um, really check for our cannabis justice accelerator. Um, that will our second year of that cohort is coming out sometime in July. We'll start talking about it in June. Again, thanks for having me. And oh, I didn't talk about the workforce development. The workforce development aspect is a part of the work direct service stuff. And it's just, you know, workforce development is not job placement. When you you have to hire people anyway. So and there's a there's a cost to that. So that is not an expense to be placed off on public dollars or to be advertised about. If you go and be if you go above and beyond, if you're doing something that is expanding the pool of high skilled laborers from the equity population, then you get to use the term workforce development. Workforce development in the Bay Area can't be anything that's $20, less than $20 with benefits or $25 without benefits. And there's other things, aspects to it, but again, it has to be um, career, career, career focused again. So in the Bay Area, I see a lot of businesses using the wrong word. They're, they're hiring people, they're staffing their business. Some of them are getting confused and using the word workforce development. So we need to make sure that we correct folks when we see that happening. Yeah, that's a super important distinction. Um, and this is a really good segue to move into Ramon's um, topic, which is the development of a certification uh, to preserve the power and value of equity verified individuals and businesses. So Ramon, take the stage. Thank you. I appreciate that that intro and segue. Um, yeah, so I'll, I will share here what we have done and give you a little introduction about myself and and where I stand. So I'm a I am a um, second generation cultivator activist. Been working in um, you know social and economic justice space for a long time. My whole life is translated by it um but um and, and so like Lenise and several others in this space that have been working you know for um social justice and economic you know equality and justice um help create language for the equity program in in Oakland San Francisco and also you know um advocating on the state level uh, to make sure that there was policies in place to, to um, make sure that we have um, entry into this. Uh, obviously on this continent, there's been over 500 years of systemic policies um, that have been put in place very purposefully to keep access to some people and limit access, create barriers of entries to others. So when uh, the, the civil rights movement um, when they had to make, say, they had to recognize that they could no longer, you know, discriminate by race and 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 sexual orientation, all those things. They they created policies that created the same type of things, but without actually saying, you know, blacks or Latinos or women were. And so what they did was they created this education and access to economic um, equality, basically they created the barriers, they made it hard. So corporate America has taken over. And 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 so, um, although I, I feel like, you know, we definitely need to change policy and we need to push that because we need to dismantle, you know, the policies that have been set in place that, that create these barriers. I also feel that, you know, a lot of this is on us as a community. Um, so once we got people licensed, 
um, the, the very quick next question was like, what are these businesses going to do? The state didn't provide any type of resources, education, training, access to lawyers, uh, the industry. And so how are these businesses going to be successful? We knew that we were going to start needing to rely on our community and organize and, our, and mobilize our community to create an ecosystem that supports itself. Um, so when we're talking about systemic racist policy, whether it's in cannabis or anything else, you know, we protest, we change policy, we've seen very little movement in, in 500 years. And so um, if, if you know anything about colonial policies and, and how they went out, like it's, it's for thousands of years, it's been a land and resource grab you know what I mean, in education. And so it's about access to those resources and limiting our access to those resources. And so that's that's the struggle that we're fighting. So uh, myself, Nina Parks, Edward Brown uh, from the original equity group started getting together and, and um, it's been five years of trying to create this equity trade certification. Um, so it's not just a trademark, it's a certification mark that's presented like fair trade, like organic to basically represent and certify businesses um, that are coming out of these communities that have been disproportionately um, impacted by these systemic racist policies. So by us identifying these businesses, um, with this equity trade. And this is a federal certification mark, first of its kind. Um, it will be the first trademarked um, symbol to go on a cannabis product. And it's about identifying our communities and those products and businesses coming out of our communities. But um, it goes beyond cannabis. So just like the conversation with equity and cannabis, the I know my purpose and several others within the space was to create a a framework um, that could go beyond just cannabis that can kind of start breaking down those barriers in corporate America and, and, and creating equity and equality in every part of our life, regardless if it's cannabis or starting a small business and, and policy and healthcare and all these different pieces of our life that we need to have access for. So um, just like fair trade and organic, we'll be able to identify these businesses will be able to push and, and demand for shelf space and um, and you know create basically a movement where we are supporting our own um, economies and those businesses like we are, sorry, I'm having a problem here. Um, we're, we're supporting those businesses that support our communities. So, um, just want to read a little piece here on the bottom It kind of identifies. So the certification marks as used are intended to be used by persons authorized by the certifier certifies or is intended to certify that the goods provided have been produced by a business that meets the standards set by a US state, county or city social equity program that seeks to address social inequalities and policy concerns related to gender sexuality, race, age, mental or physical disability, class, ethnicity, language, education, civil rights, socioeconomic status or religion by requiring that a business's ownership structure, operations, employment practices or charitable contributions demonstrate a commitment to justice and equality. So by identifying those businesses that come out of those communities and also um, identifying um, the allies in the ecosystem will be able to basically protest with our daughter, dollar, create that economic justice within our own ecosystem, our own communities. Um, and so, sorry, this deck is crazy. No, this is so creative. This is um, a way to, bring um, the whole ecosystem together and then really clearly identify it for, for the public, for consumers. Because people always ask me, well, do you have a list of black owned cannabis brands or minority owned cannabis brands? And now with this certification, consumers will be able to tell immediately that this is part of um, that philosophy 
of um, empowering marginalized people, especially in the cannabis space at this first rollout, correct? Yeah, and, and it, this is just the example. So um, I helped create the, so, the, the social equity menu and the momentum program on the ease, um, on the ease menu. Um, that was basically a push to show larger corporations how investing into the community and investing into those businesses also help their bottom line and so the the biggest factor that came out of that we have five brands that sport the equity trade certification on their menu that have been selling for uh, almost two years now in the last two quarters they sold over six million dollars of products on the social equity menu and what was even more important than that they they're a statistics company so they identified that any other brand that is on their menu, when they raise the price of that brand, they lose customer base. The social equity brands on their menu, it doesn't matter if they raise the price. They, there's the elasticity, there's no elasticity there. So like basically if, if they raise their prices, they have they maintain the same customer base, which shows that people are buying for purpose. People want to know that their money and dollar is going to a purpose and feeling good about that value of their dollar. And so with that, we like the, the war on drugs and this land grab and resource grab made us the consumers. And what they're most afraid of is that we become aware that we are the consumers, like that we fuel their success. If we stop supporting businesses that are not supporting economic or social justice or equality that are not making those commitments internally and externally that are not providing sh shelf space for small businesses and providing you know opportunities and not re and also reinvesting into those community programs that are helping to fight back those those damages that the war on drugs and the, and that over 500 years of systemic racist policies have done to our communities then we're not going to support you like we're going to show with our dollar that we support those businesses that are committed to those communities and committed to creating creating that and so that allows people from from outside the, our communities to become allies and and provide these resources and through this equity trade we've partnered with a group called signet that will have an identifier that's built on blockchain um, that you will be able to certify that that product is in a certified equity product you'll be able to see the whole supply chain so you'll be able to see the cultivator distributor retail locations that carry those products and our website will will be identifying who those are so that every business regardless you know all these social equity businesses and small businesses will will know who who they can reach out to within the supply chain that is committed to this, this movement and, and we can support our own success. If we can continue to support those that are taking from our community, we're just as implicit in those taking from our community. Mm, that's a good point. And as we transition to Dominic, um, we're going to talk about what an equity community looks like because it's gonna look different across the state of California and in other states. And so um, the creative solutions that um, Lenise and that Ramon are coming up with in their organizations um, are mostly for, or are, are targeting people in Oakland and in more of a city area, but Dominic is gonna tell us what it looks like up north um, and in more rural areas. Dominic, the stage is yours. Don't forget to unmute yourself. Thank you, Laura. Uh, I'm gonna get my uh, screen shared and let's see, why is that looking like that? Um, sorry about that. We're gonna just relaunch it and there we go. Okay. Um, so this is especially to help keep me on track. I don't want to go on too long, but it follows really well from what uh, folks have been talking about so far, which is this, you know, terrain of struggle that's that's about more than just sort of cannabis and who gets to make money off of it. 
but it's about ownership. It's about community investment. It's about systemic inequity, um, which looks different in different places, as, as Laura mentioned. Uh, but they are connected. They're not separate. They're totally connected, and they've been connected historically, uh, and then very specifically through um, a number of things that uh, cross particular jurisdictions in California, for example. So uh, it's important to note sort of where I'm coming from, and therefore where this these these comments are coming from, which is that uh, uh, I write equity assessments for jurisdictions applying uh, for SB 1294 grants. Um, there's been three rounds. They've dispersed 45 million out of the 100 million dollar fund, uh, and you know I understand that there's some movement in the legislature to make it permanent and enlarge that. Uh, assessments I've worked on. Uh, Humboldt County was the first one, uh, Mendocino County, Lake County, uh, Nevada County, uh, and the city of Clear Lake. The latter two will be applying next year, but their assessments are, are done now. Pending contract finalization, Sonoma County, uh, around the corner, San Diego County. Um, we've already been working with them uh, in a subcontracting basis, actually. So that's being led by a nonprofit, community nonprofit, um, Paving Great Futures. And city of Santa Cruz and Trinity County is also on deck. So I've, I've had uh, been doing a lot of research on you know those specific impacts in, in local places. Um, and so I want to actually start out with kind of the, the takeaways, right? Equity programs by themselves can't fix the whole system. that the problems faced by equity applicants are systemic problems, not just challenges in the narrow kind of cannabis and equity space. And I think our previous speakers have been, very articulate about that. Uh, they can make a difference in people's lives and they provide a terrain of struggle for, I think, novel ways to, to, to um, you know, use leverage, I think, to, to change things. Um, uh, and therefore, you know, it opens up the imagination for, for how things can be different and, and steps towards doing so. Uh, you know, the biggest thing I think that like it's already done is it makes systemic inequity both with legalization and broader social equity is legible in the landscape, right? The assessments write it in you know, a document and there's a report and people have to listen, right? And it's politically uncomfortable at every scale of governance associated with cannabis legalization because the, the, the branding of cannabis legalization is that, oh, you know, like we're doing something, we're fixing you know, a broken part of our system. When, when my perspective is it's part of a broken system to begin with. Uh, cannabis legalization is kind of obvious about that because it's generally designed to be compatible with you know, existing configurations of society, like the, the, the regulatory apparatuses that we have, have to like interpret, you know, what is otherwise supposed to be, you know, uh, something that's supposed to change the system. Uh, and, you know, my, my broad brush description is a financialized solution to a set of political conflicts set in motion, especially by the Nixon administration. Uh, so financialization to me as, as, as regulated com commercialization is it reproduces you know, uh, uh, a theme. Equity assessments create kind of fine-grained analyses of structural barriers to, to racial and economic, and I've got to move my, uh, racial and economic justice uh, associated with impacts of, of general systemic inequity, right? So um, in California, uh, Laura already already went through this, and I want to point out that there's there's kind of two at the state level, state funding level, and then local jurisdictions themselves also are differential with respect to like how how much they are putting money in, and it reflects organizing in communities, right? Uh, Oakland, obviously, San Francisco, uh, you know, like equity was on the table because of community organizing before the state decided to give out money, right? Humboldt also did because of its particular experience with cannabis legalization. And I, I'm sitting here in the upper right-hand corner of my screen here is the Big Ed for DA uh, sticker from the, the 1980s when uh, the campaign against marijuana planning especially were, was going after cultivating communities, legacy communities uh, in, in rural areas. Uh, and of course, that's the 1980s. It was particularly militarized. There were, were particular kinds of, of impacts that uh, you know, evolved over time and spread out through the state. And we're connected to what was going on, not only in urban California, but the global picture, actually. Like our eradication program was designed to, to convince Bolivia and Colombia 
to go ahead and eradicate basically and, and fight against their underclasses as well. There's a proof, hey, we will eradicate our peasants too, right? Um, so the essay prompt is identify impacts to communities affected by cannabis criminalization and the war on drugs, right? And, and, and I, I actually took this from San Francisco's assessment in, as my starting thing, they started with that Ehrlichman quote from uh, uh, the, the former Nixon's aide, Nixon aide in the early 1990s. The, the drug war as a set of policies was explicitly an attack on Nixon's political enemies. The anti-war left, which hippies associating can, hippies with marijuana and black communities associating blacks with heroin. That was the specific moment in time and a, a particular heroin epidemic that was actually devastating black communities at the time. Um, this evolved and obviously it became, it w th these were not the, the, the same ones, but the same logic was applied, right? Broader context, neo-colonial imperialism, the anti-war left was against imperialism, right? And racial capitalism, which our previous speakers keep coming back to is like capitalism doesn't exist essentially without slavery. It doesn't exist without dispossession. It doesn't exist without uh, essentially um, the harvesting of human lives that are disproportionately black and brown around the world, not just in the US and California, right? Um, so my, my takeaway from that is, you know, since the 1970s, you know, like Nixon's political enemies have become the, the enemies of the system, right? They were, they were identified explicitly as, as Nixon's, but Reagan's political enemies, Clinton's political enemies. And if I may say so, Obama's political enemies and Trump's political enemies, right? This is continuous, not discontinuous, right? Um, so in California, rural criminalization, you know, was evident with paramilitary eradication, but as I've learned in the process of writing these, these impact or these, uh, these, these equity assessments that, that the eradication of people's livelihoods that don't get recognized as humans with human rights in the system include, you know, this outburst of, of criminalized code enforcement, especially that happened in the aughts and continues to this day and is actually growing uh, in, in rural areas, some of them with equity programs, which is really problematic, that this is the displacement of people. Uh, um, and urban, urban criminalization, of course, we've heard about mass incarceration, but broken windows policing, actually, which is so associated essentially with law and order politics you know, came up through essentially the Clinton administration, uh, you know, going after, uh, you know, black people as signs of public disorder through the mechanism of like, let's plant some marijuana on you or get you because you might have some cannabis or are or, or consuming cannabis. And all this contributes to, uh, you know, our criminal justice system as a problem. The supply chain, what shifted in the 1970s and 1980s was cannabis mostly came from Mexico and then it became something grown in the United States. And especially in California is where this really uh, catalyzed. And um, the Emerald Triangle, you know, is the uh, territorial birthplace of that process. Obviously it's generalized, it's not just an Emerald Triangle, it's in a lot of places. Drug markets at the same time, the other side of criminalization is like, well, you know, why were black and brown people and rural people participating in the cannabis economy well, they were surplus labor and surplus people that like capitalism found no use for and participating in formal eco uh, economies as, as all informal economies, not just criminalized ones. It's a, it's a tactic for survival. Uh, it's a tactic for um, producing sustainable livelihoods, right? Uh, in California, I want to talk about a little bit about the, the later periodization rights. Uh, and, and I want to talk about the informal economy of, of medical cannabis in particular, 1996 to 2016. Relatively much, very highly equitable, low financial barriers to entry, access to ownership, a matter of social capital, um, not financial capital, right? Um, what did you need to get started as a, as a weed dealer was, you know, essentially access to someone who had wholesale cannabis and access to, you know, a social network where uh, you know uh, folks could could add value by retailing. Uh, what's interesting to me about what I've learned from these assessments is that the backlash against medical cannabis markets, a, was led by law enforcement complaints, especially framing medical cannabis as as hypocritical. It's about making money. It's not about helping people. Right. It was a, it was a reframe 
of the, the, the undesirability of these people. Um, and how did they, you know, what, what was about increasingly legible markets in the landscape? You could see retail storefronts in urban areas. You could see plants out in the sun instead of underground like they were in the 1990s, even in rural areas. And, 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 and to me, like, you know, was it the plants or was it the people, right? The, the political systems, undesirables, economic ones as well, right? Economic crisis has played a huge role in the impacts, the systemic impacts of both criminalization and uh, market informalization. The 2008 financial crisis cor correlates exactly with the explosion of legible cannabis markets in urban and rural areas. People were losing their houses. People lost their houses. You know, the, the, the cost of, of living in urban areas caused them to move somewhere else. And, and many people used essentially the cannabis market as a way to, to not become dispossessed or to relocate themselves in, in a landscape that had no help coming from the federal government, none. The help from the federal government, that, that package, the rescuing of the economy rescued our financial markets, our stock markets. They didn't help people, uh, they helped essentially stock markets. That's how we chose to respond to it. And people said, you know what, like we're gonna help ourselves, right? So I haven't used this word neoliberalism, but it's relevant. Uh, uh, it's, it's a name for what's happened in this country since Nixon, essentially starting with, with essentially Nixon. Uh, uh, and let's call it the name for the system at the moment as an economic policy ideology, fiscal austerity for the poor, monetary stimulation for financial markets. But it's also a political ideology that works to preserve and expand the power of mostly white male financial capital. And so the question is, where does legalization fit in there? And therefore, what is, what is equity trying to, to, to change, right? It's this solution where it's like, okay, private markets, you're on your own, you know, that's how you're gonna fix your impacts. Uh, you know, absent actual community reinvestment, access to healthcare, access to education and so forth. Um, the drug war has not failed by that metric. The drug war has succeeded wildly in helping preserve essentially, uh, you know, who had power and money in this country. Uh, and so that's, you know, of critical importance for like the policies, like what are they addressing, a failure or a success? And like what we do because of that matters, right? Thank so, you so much. Yeah, those are, that, that's it actually, I'm at, I'm at the end of it. Excellent, thank you. So um, moving on to our researchers from San Jose State University, we'll start with um, Bill, take the stage. Thanks, and uh, I think we have some slides as well, cool. So, um, hey everyone, I'm gonna try and go quickly because I, I wanna make sure we have plenty of time for discussion. And, and it, some of the things we, we had in our slides uh, have already been uh, discussed by some of the previous panelists. So we can skip over some of that too. So uh, we'll try and be very practical with our time. Yeah, so in terms of defining cannabis equity, I really like the way, I, really, I really wanna compliment my, my panelists. Um, Laura and, and Lenise, Lenise in particular um, had, really the kind of vision that we at the HRI uh, have been pushing through this en entire uh, many, many year process, as, as Ramon uh, uh, said before, um, which is a cooperative and collective or, or even, uh, dare I say it, socialist model, something that I've been arguing and we've been arguing from the very beginning of these conversations, even back to the early 2000s, um, in, in arguing that otherwise this is going to be a capital gain, right? Uh, uh, that, that really there's no way to sort of... Um, make some magical uh, uh, protection, protection around the, uh, uh, these particular players and what is a multi-billion dollar industry in California and a much larger industry in the United States and Western Hemisphere. And so I, I, I first of all wanna say that I agree wholeheartedly with uh, Ramon and others who, who have said that, that this, this has been and should only be defined by, by those in you know, what we're now calling uh, equity populations, right? The folks of color and the working class people that really bore the brunt uh, of the drug war and, and, and did all the work to create the cannabis industry as we know it. So um, I just wanna uh, say that, and we can skip this slide because everyone else covered it very quite, quite well, I think. And so um, moving into background, 
uh, we just wanted to kind of talk a little bit about how we as a human rights institute came into the cannabis space. So it, generally speaking, you know, this is one of the many projects that we, we work on as a team and a broader working group at San Jose State. And, and um, I, we're really proud of this work in the cannabis space, but, but like I said, it's, it's, it's one of several things we do. So our, our broader mission, if you will, is to inform policy and practice in California and really the nation um, with the highest human rights standards and, and highest sort of best practices from, from, from the international standpoint. And cannabis is no exception here. And, and what we find is, is actually some quite clear um, standards from, from international bodies and international findings on the best practices to move from a failed uh, prohibition model to a model of public health and a model of, of economic reinvestment and sustainability. And so um, that's really what drives our work and, and the, to the extent that we were pulled in to many of these processes, that, that's the role that we really tried to play along with, with, with some of our, our, our community members, uh, uh, like some of the folks sitting here with us today that I'm so happy to share the stage with, you feel me? So um, that, that's really how we come in and, and we, we were fortunate enough to form really close bonds with folks and, and, and get to learn quite a bit from them as well. So uh, just going through this really quickly, uh, just so folks know kind of where we've been involved in, in, in the game, so to speak. Um, we started off really uh, doing our true job, which is to provide the research, the data, that was used in many of the equity reports uh, throughout the state that, that for those who don't know, if you wanna start an equity program at the local level in California, one of the, what's now become an almost necessary step is to create an equity report such that you can use data to suggest who the actual populations were that were most impacted by the failed drug war. I mean, that's my easiest way to summarize that. And so San Francisco did one of the initial ones of those and it was also one of the most massive. It's this huge report, right? Um, and uh, Dr. Mike Males and I were the ones that really uh, provided the, the foundational research for that report. And so from there, we were kind of pulled organically into all of these conversations as they, as they rolled forward. And that's where I got to meet some of these good folks here. Um, so uh, we, we worked with, with Ramon and others on the San Francisco Working Group, which has, been an, which has been an amazing experience for me personally and for us as an institute. Uh, we were a co-founder of the San Jose Equity Working Group. Uh, consulted city, city of San Jose on cannabis equity, which is ongoing. Actually, they're moving to land land use now to expand the, the equity program now in San Jose. Um, yeah, I don't know that I'm ready to clap. It's been a long time, fam. I don't know that this is necessarily something we should we should celebrate or, or, or what. But um, yeah, we're happy that that's at least happening. Um, we also authored the, the, the equity ordinance here in San Jose that's now being expanded, like I said. Uh, we worked with uh, then Assemblyman, bon uh, then uh, you know uh, California Assemblyman Bonta, now now AG Bonta on the Bonta bill. Um, we worked with Santa Clara County, to, and this is really what we're proud of, to be honest with you. And this is where we really agree with our 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 colleagues at the Hood Incubator in terms of what this movement has been about from jump, right? And and it's it, because of all the money involved, it's real easy for people to lose lose their their focus on the fact that a ton of people are still sitting with their record on. Uh, and that's in California, right? Because like we'll point out later, California did not have a robust system of doing this. So, so we were real proud of our work with Santa Clara County to clear over 13,000 records for over 9,000 folks. And now we're currently collaborating with other folks to try and spread that good work throughout the state. All right, so I guess I will take some of the kind of problems here real quick. And, and I think some of this has been highlighted before. Um, but part of the issue here is if you look at the, the varying definitions of equity, um, equi there is no standardized definition really of, of equity. And even in our initial kind of conversation amongst ourselves here, we had a different, different understandings of who the populations were. Um, and I think Dominic raises really good points in, in um, kind of emphasizing that there's local conditions, right? There are local families, there are people um, um, whose livelihoods have been um, damaged uh, in, in different areas. But when, when uh, kind of the broader populace thinks about equity, they're thinking about people who have been impacted um, uh, you know, by uh, arrest tactics, right? There's racial discrimination and racially disproportionate stops um, arrests at every phase of the criminal justice um, system, right? So uh, part of the, the, the issue here is that we are trying to figure out how best to tap and identify the communities that have ha borne the brunt of the war on drugs um, in, an, in an effort to um, mitigate some of those harms. Uh, but looking forward, uh, we've, we've, we've 
trying to get people in place so that they can benefit from the market um, and the expansion of cannabis um, uh, industry, billions of dollars at stake. One of the problems that we've encountered is this local, the, the tension between kind of the goals and the, and the public talking, the you know, public relations talking points of many equity programs is that local control means that um, um, well-intentioned programs never get off the ground. It means that there aren't any incentives financially for local players. Um, indeed, equity is some of the, 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 the ways that this is rolled out. We have equity folks competing with each other for a really limited number of grants and licenses. Um, and, and because of the delay in some of the record clearance um, technical challenges, right, um, the folks that were ostensibly supposed to benefit from uh, cannabis clearance, uh, record clearance by law in California, never were able to avail themselves of that relief. So not only do we have this kind of uh, um, money flowing in, we don't have the people who are ready who were ready, right, who were already ready, um, able to participate in the market in the same way. Right? And so um, I'll let um, uh, Professor Armeling kind of go through some of the local challenges, but if you look at some of the maps, there's many, many, many areas in the state where you couldn't get delivery, right, where it is legally prohibited, right, to operate. And so as folks compete for these little islands of legality, um, we really need to have a more structured way of defining equity and, and tracing the kind of impact um, uh, both you know, historically what has happened um, and then moving forward, right? So I used to live in Oakland. Oakland has changed a lot in the past 20 years and um, San Jose too, right? Um, the Bay Area has a lot of money and a lot of talk about equity, but it doesn't seem to be getting to the ground as, as, as it should given the amount of resources and political attention to the issue. Um, one, of the, one of those challenges is the lack of local capacity. So for example, barriers to record clearance are, um, uh, we don't have court systems that have databases that update to the Department of Justice. These are kind of really technical, um, how do we structure data? How do we want our, our criminal justice infrastructure to work? Um, and a lot of California is, is um, very isolated. So it, right now I'm seeing we have some justice by geography um, and equity uh, also seems to be um, uh, suffering that justice by geography, injustice by geography kind of uh, fate. Oh, sorry, Bill, I'll let you finish up there on, and then the un unintended uh, consequences of local control. Um, yeah. Uh, so I, I think I think you did a really good job, media. The, the thing that I think we're really trying, the point we're trying to make here is the state really abdic abdicated its role. Uh, uh, they, they, you know, and, and everybody knows it now, <laughs> right? And and it's been on to the work of good folks like you've heard from today to pick up that mantle. Now, unfortunately, we have some really good folks. We have wonderful organizers that are doing that very hard work, and it's mostly thankless and it's mostly without pay, right? But at the same time, if we want to really see success actual honest to god across the board success where people actually have those records cleared and these folks actually have economic opportunity and reinvestment then i don't think there's any way to avoid uh the fact that the state has to step up and actually do what what much smaller states and much smaller cannabis markets are doing right now as we speak as they come out with their plans right and the, you know they're not they're not doing that because it's the wrong way to go they're doing that because they're learning from some of the lessons of california and elsewhere um, so we want to go ahead and, and wrap up, go to the next, the next slide. This is the, uh, I'm sorry, this is the next slide. So, so just really quick, um, we really think there needs to be a more robust uh, uh, sort of state program. We really think there needs to be robust uh, state funding forms of both state support and infrastructure support. And we also think that uh, uh, we, and this is something that I've been thinking about as well with regard to our, our colleagues here at Berkeley and our colleagues throughout the state, we think there might be a, a smarter way uh, uh, to distribute the state funds in terms of this kind of research and this, this kind of building uh, that might, might match what some of my other panelists have shared. My suggestion would be a standing research consortium on the state uh, that involves those of us that have actually, go figure, been involved in these conversations over the years, rather than those that have the, the, the best access to policymakers to compete for grants. I'll let that sit with everyone for a moment. Uh, right. And so I would really support if we are really talking about cooperative work and, and collectivism and these sorts of things, then then I think there's a much smarter way to go about distributing, say, $30 million a year in those funds that we all know 
should be spent uh, perhaps uh, in a different way. Um, and, and I think I, I say that not only out of our participation and participation of others, others here, but as a broader statement on, on you know, the, this whole conversation on equity, right, where we really have to think clearly about what are the big picture uh, sort of structures and infrastructures that are necessary to get this done such that this we don't keep coming back to this table the same way that many of us have for 15 years now to say, hey, you know, like I love the way my, my colleague did earlier. She's like, you know, we do all this work and then a bunch of people come in and it's like, oh, we have this now, everybody. The, the adults are here. The adults are here. You, 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 all, you all can go home now. Right. And so so I just I, 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 I couldn't have said it better. And I want to point out that that's probably the, the, the thing folks should take away from today. Uh, and I'll, I'll close with that. Thank you so much, everyone, for your time. I'll say one more thing, and then I'll close up too. Um, uh, I, I want to note that there's really a lot of um, uh, need for established industry players and um, to, to, to reach back to folks who were there first um, and make sure that they have a seat at the table to divest some of their earnings into the communities where they are citing their work and to expand opportunities across the spectrum of related industries. So it's not just focused on this kind of parochial, you know, cannabis farmer cultivator in the setting sun, but we're talking about environmental impact assessment, getting students and young people into testing and other related industries so that there's, um, they have portable skills, right? And we're not locking people into um, uh, one position on in this kind of idyllic uh, I, uh, version of what the cannabis industry is. Um, and, and one thing I want to point out, and I really think that I'm like, this is the call to arms for all the white folks who are concerned about how can I use my voice and my power, and that power is your pocketbook. And that is by supporting equity first in line for recreational use, consumption, licensing. Um, give people the chance to have a storefront if they want to, but um, I think we're going to be having to, to push back against some of the um, nimbyism, right, and um, make sure that our um, the rest of our community members are adequately informed about um, uh, the cannabis industry and the concept of equity so that it can become, like Ramon is saying, as like a brand that people want to buy and people can, consumers can then um, redirect some of the market failures that we see here as a result of building this um, and kind of tacking equity on uh, at the end. You have to start with equity and that has to be the foundation going forward. So um, I think for, from our perspective and a human rights perspective, a public health perspective, uh, California is a cautionary tale, not a leader in this field. Wow, powerful words. Um, and that's oh, kind of- By the way, because, because uh, um, we're, we're a little bit uh, short on funding for all of this good work that we've been doing. We're, we're happy to invite folks to uh, give and we're happy to provide forums for other equity applicants and people who want to um, speak their piece about this issue. Uh, come work with us in the Bay Area. Thank you so much. Well, now we can start with questions. If any of the panelists have questions for each other or any of the audience have questions for the panelists, um, you can go to the bottom of your screen where it says Q&A and um or, or into the chat and and please uh you know introduce yourself and ask any questions you have um i wanted to ask uh, bill and edith is there a cannabis undergrad or um any sort of uh, curriculum going on at at your university any courses trying to do a cluster hire kind of um, where we look at, and, and, and similar to, to the center, to Berkeley Center, um, to have some environmental, some kind of um, a business oriented um, uh, work. But there, while there is interest in that, I think we need to be able to develop a more direct pipeline, right, for internships and things like that. So it's actually, as you just said that, writing in the chat, if any industry folks or people who are in academics or who are in these kind of uh, related fields, uh, environmental assessment, testing, other things like that, um, let us know because we have a bunch of first gen students um, who are interested in working in the cannabis industry, but in not necessarily in distribution or cultivation. So um, I think it's in development and I think uh, Professor Armeline has quite a following um, uh, on, on drug uh, policy and drug reform kind of issues, uh, but there is no specific um, uh, major in cannabis 
which I, as you know, I'm not quite sure parents would accept that. <laughs> but I think like, as you frame it, like we said, it's not, you know, there's a, a huge industry here. And I think um, our, our, uh, there are some limitations on what CSUs can do indeed, right, with that kind of money. And I think you see as well. So um, we'll see, but I think it's brewing. And I definitely think that there's students that are interested. I, I would just say that, uh, like I said before, our, our student base is really the human rights minor program. And uh, we have students in that program that, that do work in the cannabis space and, and we support that work. Uh, as we you know, do projects in that space, uh, we have uh, faculty, staff, and students who, who work on that. Uh, so like I said before, we're, uh, we're a little bit different than, than some of our colleagues uh, uh, in terms of centers and institutes that, that our focus is, is, is human rights, actually. We work in housing, we work in uh, 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 other forms of criminal justice reform, policing reform, but cannabis has just been one place where we've, we've really uh, invested and and our students have invested and, and so we'll, we'll remain invested in that, that issue. That's wonderful. So for any students or people looking to study cannabis from a human rights perspective, these are two experts that you can refer to, read their publications and tap into. Um, Dominic, really quickly, are there any cannabis courses or any sort of curriculum going on at Humboldt State University? So I'm gonna be, I, I'm not super authorized to make this hugely public right now. We are in the process of developing an undergraduate degree curriculum uh, in cannabis studies called, um, well, I wanted to name it Integrative uh, Cannabis Studies, but uh, uh, we're, the, the title is TBD, but the concentrations will be in environmental stewardship, stewardship yeah. and equity, equity and social justice. And so uh, it would be a core- oh, curricular reform. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> it, would be a, it would be a core that focuses on like the, the, the history, geography, and contemporary landscape of cannabis prohibition and legalization. And then the concentrations would be aimed towards you know, equipping students with tools to apply what they've learned to make social change. And so the, the equity and social justice concentration would have like, you know, grant writing, community engagement, you know, oriented towards tools that are portable to not just cannabis work, but mm -hmm. equity work much more broadly speaking. So it's, to me, it's kind of this applied law, boutique law and society kind of program that uses cannabis as a gateway to, you know, understanding, you know, systemic inequity, environmental as well, right? The environmental stewardship uh, one is gonna be interesting too, but like a, as a core, they'll, they'll take, you know, sustainability and issues uh, as well as equity issues and racial justice issues. And then they, they would go into the concentrations which have their particular tool sets that they could use. And so that's uh, at a stage right now, which it will be submitted by the end of the semester to the Cal State system. We've been working with the Cal State system and the board of trustees to, there were a lot of guardrails on it. Um, it's not there to, to train people to work in the industry. It's, it's, it's there to be change agents essentially and to work in professions where like having this background knowledge could help them you know, change what's happening within it. Because you get that in some of the regulatory positions where it's not necessarily, it's, it's a social change position, but it's occupied by people who don't have that that orientation so they can't really do it. Uh, and so, yeah, that's an unauthorized announcement of something that we've, we've been, we've had to by necessity keep under wraps, um, but. Uh, okay, so you heard it here first. <laughs> um, so on the actual workforce development training part of, um, of what's needed um, in this, these cannabis equity programs that are being rolled out, um, Let's uh, hear from Lenise and Ramon on um, a question from the audience. What do you think are some ways in which $30 million a year um, could be better distributed? Um, and let's talk about that in terms of um, research and also like support for these programs. How could we, how could we spend $30 million a year? <laughs> a lot of ways, but well, like uh, you know, our my whole 
outlook on this has always been um, provide those resources to the, to the organizations that exist now that have been doing the work. We have a lot of grass, you know, community organizations that have been working on impacts from the war on drugs or systemic racist policies. You know, Lenise Hood Incubator, they have programs like there's a lot of local programs that have nothing to do with cannabis that are doing the work of reintroducing, giving soft skills training like SF Success Center and, and all these little organizations that have been doing the work for decades and, and trying to work back to, to um, create those, you know, fix those impacts. And they're not the ones that are getting this money. It's, you know, it's, you know, all these larger organizations that are having exactly no impact in our communities. And so that's, even when we're talking about policy and, and all of that, that's that's always been the problem is that those that are impacted by these policies are not being heard. And so how can you try to fix those impacts if you don't know what those impacts are? And so again, it's about bringing those people to the table that have been in those communities, hands-on doing the work, listening to them, hearing what those challenges and impacts are and applying those resources to that. Like, um, it shouldn't be new, newly formed organizations that are getting this. It should be the people that have been doing the work. We, and we have, there's several of them throughout the state that, that have been working with these communities, in, you know, directly impacts and they have no access to it. And so just like the resources for the equity programs coming down to the cities and counties, that should be proportional directly in terms of the impacts of, of what the war on drugs had in those communities. So like, a, you know, it, it it definitely should be directly por proportional because different communities had different impacts and, and that's what we're trying to repair. And so honestly, um, like there should be a push to make sure that those organizations that have been hitting the streets and doing the work get that money first and then others that want to add to that, then they get it. <laughs> Do you want to chime in, Lenise? Yeah, I mean, if 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 this if this thirty million is the is about the pot uh, for the research dollars, I would just say um, take an equity lens to who is deemed as viable or qualified to execute a research, uh, because you start there with the first problem. Um, just you know. Just, just, just the design um, behind research um, can start off real racist. I mean, you know, there's so many things we could point to eugenics. Um, so I guess what I'm saying is for me, it's not even about what happened, who gets the money. It's about even what are you asking whoever, because you can, you, can, you can go find a black person to study why we make black people violent, you know, like that's not <laughs> so you know what's the topic that you, you know, that, that's not an ethical topic. That that's that's crazy. Um and so I, I think we gotta we gotta start there. Um and then it's so not just you know is the research method that we're using equitable in and of itself is the people that we're tasking to execute the you know a lot of times um, you know, folks don't, I've just seen some bad, I've just seen some bad research, I'll say, and I, and I only took like two graduate level statistic, statistic type classes, so, um, and that's saying that, that people need to, to be able to execute a good survey, you need a graduate level statistics, but I'm imagining if the government's spending 30 million dollars, you're at least going to make sure that, that that part of of, of, of it is covered and that's not happening. So we're gonna forego the, 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 the mathematical accuracy and scientific um, method for just paying whoever is white and male, then, you know, anyway, research is really important. I love research, I love numbers. Um, and I think really going back to the fact that if you actually take the researchers and partner them up with grassroots organizations, that would be really strong. Even if the grassroots organization doesn't get the money, but the grassroots organization is a partner in the design of the, the, the research, that's really powerful because when I'm talking about that power building, how do we do the power building so that we can execute policies so that we can have policies that allow us to, to run our best businesses? 
Um, that's from the power. And how do we at leverage that? Oftentimes we have good data reports. And how do we get data reports? People who cared about us to commission reports that would then help us further our cause. So I'm not sure if all, you know, the, I, I think I, I believe in good partnerships, I guess. And so I'm not sure if I'm saying give the money directly to the hood incubator. I'm saying give the money to whatever the top leading data firm is and have them part with, partner with the top leading grassroots organization. Like, I mean, we, we respect everyone in their role, just don't disrespect people in their role. Mm. And we can have really good collaborations. And there has to be accountability for that as well. Like, you know, those organizations that are getting that money, they need to be able to provide the, the data and showing that that the work that they're doing is, is actually impactful. And that, that's the problem with the equity programs and, and all of these policies is that there is no accountability really. And so it doesn't matter if you put a policy in place and, and people commit resources, if, if there's no accountability showing that those people are actually doing that or that those impacts are, are impacting the people that they say they're impacting, then we're just filtering money into people's pockets. One thing I just wanna kind of call to folks' attention is um, the idea that we're in some post-criminalization phase is incorrect. If you look at where they're tar like the legalization in the way that it has been done without putting equity first has resulted in former uh, equity, people who would be considered equity operators being criminalized because they're operating outside of the, the, the law, right? And so the enforcement efforts, which are then in increased as a result of the tax money from this are, are being generated back into enforcement, which then retargets the very communities which are supposed to be um, not facing criminalization, right? And so one of the other things I want to note is that um, uh, another person uh, had mentioned this, uh, but but just to bring it home, this has compounding effects every day that we do not do something about this because people who are getting into the industry now don't have any connections to the equity populations and the, the OGs who are there. So if we're trying to do this and we just let equity ride, it's it's passed. The moment has passed because you have already let the market close for other folks, right? So I really want to encourage folks who are interested in this issue to talk to Ramon, um, talk to Lenise, but, but the, I think Ramon said it best when we were having the prep for this is that the only way to do it is that we start buying from ourselves. We make our own market and you make that a thing that consumers want. Um, otherwise, we're going to be kind of in this mythic world where white folks are able to access profit from and use marijuana and pretty much wherever they want. And folks that are not like that are still being criminalized and we're seeing the continuing and in, in, in fact, increasing elaboration of the very apparatuses that are the problem that we were thought we were getting away from, right? So um, if you got a chunk of equity money, you better find somebody to share it with is my takeaway for that. Well said. Um... We had a question um, in the chat and it says, I'll read it verbatim, uh, as race is a sensitive topic in the cannabis industry, as well as, the U as well as the US, what advice would you offer to a white male who plans to have a vertically integrated cannabis company? Um, and so I would say that nobody here is trying to prevent um, white or Anglo folks from entering the cannabis industry. Um, it's just that what, what is most ethical and most reparative and sustainable is to make sure that equity programs uh, are, um, are strong. Do you wanna expand on that, Ramon? Yeah, also like it's it's the same work that, that we've been doing with with identifying what allyship looks like, right? What it what is a true ally? And a true ally is is somebody who like those resources that they have to, to do that, they're applying it in a very equitable fashion, that that, that they're being very um, deliberate about creating an internal structure that is accessible, that does provide ownership, that does commit resources back into those communities or those equity programs that does take in, in consideration that that their access to that is going to be a lot easier than some other individuals. And so 
finding a way, honestly, to partner in with equity applicants and providing access to that education and resources, finding a way to be a partner with those other applicants that might have harder structures. Yes, it, it, it takes some sacrifice, but it, it also shows that commitment to, to being a part of the community as, as just being you know, something that's taken from the community. So like there's ways to internally and externally make sure that that your business structure and, and your business model has those commitments created and just providing a structure that 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 basically it is accessible that that provides some kind of resource to those applicants or, or the community that's able to take that and then in turn create ownership, which is the point of the equity programs is to get back to to you know having some generational wealth and creating ownership within these these businesses and communities. I'll let Lynn. And the yeah, and then I would say everything everything Ramon said, and then also I think it's just important to remember um, if you're always thinking about equity and and, and a collaboration and from the core, then. Like for example, I had one um, white business owner reach out to me and they're like, we don't have a lot of money to give. And, you know, we, we want to find equity applicants. And, you know, I, I, I would say, you know, um, headhunting is always a cost, you know? So going to a black led organization and saying, you must know some black people. So bring them to me because I want to do equity is in and of itself inequitable because you're literally looking for headhunting cost, which is costful for free. So, then, so don't start there, right? Don't start there. But then, okay, so you're looking for help headhunting. You don't, maybe you are a small business and you actually can't afford the cost of headhunting and the other ways you have filled your positions have just been through your grapevine network. We could, we could understand that. So what I suggested to these people that they're interested, I was like, I don't have time, but you know, one thing I can give back to you. And you know, if you actually do this and come back to me, then I could say from your actions that you're actually serious and you weren't just actually trying to get labor from me for free. Um, I, I threw it out there. I said, well, you know what you're looking for on your shelves. You know, as a buyer, what you're looking for. And so if you keep saying that you can't find black people or brown people or woman people or what are people you're looking for to source from, then do it the other way. Just like you would any other time you put an RFQ out. You host, you, 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 you put together a packet saying exactly what you're looking for. You host a community, you host an event, you, you, you put it all together, you reach out to the to organization like me now, and now you're looking for me to do outreach or, or to partner with it, but you've actually done 80% of the work, which is being like, oh, you know what, we realize Folks keep coming to us with tinctures, but we're really looking for tab sublinguals. And so that's what we're looking for, looking for sublinguals, looking for pre-rolls. We keep going with these tinctures. And so we're gonna put a call out because we're gonna like try and fill the gap with what we have on our shelves. And you can take that model and fill it in anywhere. And again, it's like you, no one's expecting you to lead the social justice movement. And I personally, I'm gonna take a, a thing that some of my black and brown colleagues don't agree with me on. It's like, I personally don't even think white people that own or leaders in these businesses are accountable to anything that happened to do with the drug war or reversing the impact of it or the enforcement. I think you're accountable for being a good human and having diversity, equity, inclusion in your industry and in, in your business like any other business. But as far as the drug war, no. But here's the thing, again, with that whole humanity thing, this thing called empathy, you might have heard about this thing that went down. And if you do have empathy, and if you do have this ability to touch into your humanity, you might actually care and be like, oh man, like, you know, the government did this to them, the government did this to me, this sounds like my ally, I don't need to be ashamed, I'm not taking responsibility, I'm not accountable, I am stepping up in solidarity, that's the only emotion that I need from a white business owner if they think they're going to do anything about dismantling the, the impacts of the, of the drug war, I need you to know that it's your fight, because they coming for you, just like they have, like, 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 like Dominic was talking about in Humboldt. It's not like you're trying to help me, you're trying to help you. And if you come to this with you trying to help you, then we're gonna be good. But if you don't have that level of consciousness or political, politicization yet, and you're just at the point where you have to do the thing so that you can run your business, then think of it as you would any other thing. Put an RFQ out, 
for whatever you're looking for and you can just work on your supply chain. And that's kind of my take on it. Mm -hmm. um, thank you, Lenise. It's 2021. If you don't have um, in equity and inclusion and sustainability as part of your business model, you should not be in business. That's what I'll say. Um, and if you are a white centric business, you could be in a place where there aren't a lot of people of color, then revert back to those qualities that Lenise said, which is um, empathy and humanity. How can you help the marginalized people in your community? Um, everybody in the United States, every state has been, you know, has its own little cannabis market. So get to know your community, get to know the policy, get to know the players who have already been moving, um, the movement forward. And um, for, for people who are looking for more education, institutions like um, the Cannabis Research Center at UC Berkeley, institutions like the Human Rights Institute at San Jose State, State University, and, um, and the humble organizations that Dominic are working for are just a few of the academic institutions who are putting forth different levels of, of information and collaboration. Um, and, and so whatever state you live in, whatever community you live in, uh, try to find where your, you know, your best, uh, connections are, whether it's an educator from the public sector, an educator from higher ed or, um, NGOs, nonprofit groups. The big part of cannabis is getting to know the whole universe that surrounds it. That's just a microcosm for everything else that's going on. Um, and so just a few things that I wanted to point out is that data is really important um, to help define social equity in whatever region it's in. Um, we talk about local control and local capacity. Um, those things can be problematic because as several um, other panelists mentioned, the state has let go of its accountability. Um, and maybe, you know, this is more of an opportunity for uh, local advocates to strengthen um, communication and and um, and collaboration, but um, I, I even think personally that it's good that it's not federally federally legal yet because we still need time to strengthen and scale up uh, programs on the local level. Uh, so I want to thank everybody for coming. We're at 1.24 p.m. Are there any last words, comments, concerns? Um, thank you if you stayed with us. We went over time, but this has been a really um, excellent conversation and a good exchange. Um, are there any last words from anybody? Just want to thank everybody and, and uh, the panelists and understand that, you know, there's inter intersectionality between all of our, you know, conflicts with, with systemically racist policies and so if we we kind of focus on on that intersectionality and like Lenny said just becoming um good human beings and knowing what that is it doesn't always take money it just you know a lot of times that those connections just take access and so you know just you know your information and just reaching out and being genuine is is very important and i appreciate all the panelists Thank you, Laura and UC Berkeley for giving us this panel and, and this stage to be able to express our ideas and uh, anybody feel free to reach out anytime. Like let's let's build this ecosystem, the community where we support our own successes. Thank you, Ramon. Anybody else? Oh, we just, uh, on behalf of Edith and myself, I just wanna say thank you from the HRI to our hosts at Berkeley. Um, uh, to Dominic, to Ramon, to Lanis, to, 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 to everyone. And, and Laura, you did a great job hosting today. Uh, again, I, I really want to uh, um, commend you on your opening report where you talked about things like a land trust, public land, you, you know, some actual, again, like moving toward real um, um, sort of socialist collectivist policies that could begin to challenge uh, some of the ways we've been doing these things. So um, I'm just happy to be a part of it and whatever we can do moving forward to, to help out, we're always here to serve. Thank you. Dominic? Oh, you're on mute, Dom. <laughs> Thank you so much, everyone. It's an honor to be here with you and to learn from you. Uh, this is just the beginning. And I feel like, you know, the, the networks we're making now around this stuff, 
I, it's going to be a long path. And I, I think that um, it's just encouraging to just find people who've been, you know, working in their particular areas and to be able to, to link up with them and uh, to, to share the struggle and the, and, and the burden of it to leverage this into, into real social change. And, and thank you all so, so much, really. Thank you, everybody. For the audience who joined us, thank you for participating and staying a little bit longer so that we could finish our discussion. Um, if you have any questions about the Cannabis Research Center, you can email info at crc.berkeley.edu. Um, if you check the chat, I believe the panelists have um, added their contact information and some interesting resources. So please check the chat really quickly. Uh, for Ramon, if you needed to contact him, you can reach him at equitytradecertification at gmail.com. And um, I think Dominic also had somebody reach out to him. And uh, so Dominic can be contacted at uh, scroll, scroll, scroll. <laughs> Down at the bottom, dc285 at, at humboldt.edu. Yes. And then for our researchers from San Jose, you can reach Edith at edith.kinney at sjsu.edu. And Bill is william.armaline at sjsu.edu. Thank you, everybody. Have a great rest of the day. And uh, next month, we'll be having a panel talking about federal legalization, which I'll be moderating. I hope you tune in, and we'll see you later. Thank you. <laughs>